and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between the New Art School and Design Deducts Podcast. Our guest today is Timothy Samara. Welcome, Timothy. Hello, Charles. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It is fantastic to have you here. Tell us about you. Uh, where should I start? I'm guessing you mean <clears throat> from a design standpoint. Um, I grew up uh, in a family of artists uh, in upstate New York. Uh, my father was uh, a commercial photographer doing uh, corporate work for annual reports and packaging and advertising. My mother was in painting school. Uh, my father's brother is a painter. His sister has turned out to be a painter of various kinds. Uh, his father was a uh, uh, a printer worked in a letterpress print shop so it was kind of you know art and design were kind of in the water uh so to speak um and so even though i um um you know, sort of dabble with the idea of, of doing something else like becoming a doctor um there was kind of a natural progression um going to art school uh, i started drawing at a really really early age uh, around two or three. Um, and weirdly, uh, around the age of four or five, I began to make books, um, sort of illustrated manuals about things like spiders or ducks and things like that. I was very, very interested in nature and also kind of weirdly teaching and also putting it into a kind of a, um, a visual form. Um, so it's, uh, you know, kind of telling, I guess. Uh, I ended up going to school in Philadelphia at the University of Arts, um, which... Uh, in not so many words is, I guess, the, the program there was kind of the, the second uh, outpost from the Basel School of Design. So all of my instructors uh, had been uh, students of Armin Hoffman and Emil Ruder. Um, so that should tell you something. <laughs> um, and then when I graduated, I, I started out uh, in, in uh, kind of the corporate world doing uh, branding um, for the most part. Uh, and uh, you know some advertising and such. Um, a couple of years out of school, I I found that I I didn't really play well with others, uh, and I didn't really like the kind of the work that I was doing. So I opened my own studio. I moved back upstate uh, from New York, and um, uh, I ran a studio for seven years um, and did primarily branding, a lot of communication design. Um, and at the time, also the web was starting up, so I I got into new media, as it was called back then. Yeah. Uh, and then after that, um, how did that end? Uh, I eventually relocated uh, to New York again um, to work with uh, a fellow alum from uh, University Arts. Um, the dot-com boom was huge, so that was around two, in the late 90s, 2000. Um, and then the dot-com bust came, and I was out of a job. <clears throat> so I bounced around a little bit. Um, I did some work uh, for a large public relations firm. I did some freelance uh, work. And then I sort of very accidentally happened uh, uh, upon uh, teaching. A friend of mine had, had noticed a, a kind of a mailer uh, for uh, the School of Visual Arts. Uh, and she said, why don't you see if they need somebody to teach? So I called them up kind of out of the blue. And we had a weird 20-minute <clears throat> Um, the uh, program director and I had a, a weird kind of 20 minute conversation where he didn't ask to look at my work. I was like, okay, do you want to teach typography? Okay, sure. And that's how it started. And then I, <clears throat> I began to build kind of a, a sort of a roster of classes, uh, both at the uh, School of Visual Arts and then um, at FIT, uh, at uh, NYU. And so I was teaching around at several places um, for a while. Um, and eventually I had you know, enough where I could stop doing, um, you know, the actual professional work. And, uh, and that's how I made my living. And right around that time, um, the program director at School of Visual Arts had gotten uh, an email from the publisher at uh, Rockport uh, Books. Um, they were looking to do a book on the grid. Uh, and <clears throat> as luck would have it, my senior capstone project in school was about the grid. And it seemed like like a kind of a good match, so that's how uh, my my foray into into writing uh, started. So that was so making breaking the grid. I guess so that was two thousand three was my first book, and then it just kind of kept going after that. Um, and so now I'm up to something like ten or so. Uh, every now and then I do I do one every couple of years just to <laughs> keep myself busy. So making and breaking the grid started. It was inspired from your graduation project. 
Uh, I mean, not, not directly. They they had uh, the publisher had uh, invented this or kind of visualized this subject matter. Um, I guess it, it was a weird a weird time, right around two thousand one, two thousand two. The um, the grid suddenly kind of began to bubble to the surface in the design world as something to think about again, where it had kind of disappeared for a little while. Nobody was talking about it. Um, and so, and at the same time, you, you know, you, you saw a couple of other books on the same subject uh, appear, uh, Kimberly Alam's book, uh, and then, um, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember her name. Um, I have it somewhere. Um, the other one, uh, it'll come to me. Uh, and so I, so that was the, the first one. And so I, I had had a lot of experience, you know, and had already done a great deal of research, um, uh, on the grid itself, and I was very comfortable using it. So, just trying to articulate it for others, and not to kind of repeat what others had said about it, in particular Weller Brockman. So that was, you know, kind of the golden, the golden source uh, at the time. So I was trying to, you know, kind of give it uh, a little bit more of a, um, not really a contemporary spin, but to kind of break it down in, in a way that was a little bit more accessible and, and more practical in terms of use, not quite so theoretical. Um, and that's how that's that's how that started. So, um, and then after that, I just kept doing these books over and over again. It's a very beautiful book, and of course, you know, I'm a great fan of all your, all your work. Oh, thank you, thanks. So, what is the latest project you're working on? So, I, I've been working for the past uh, six six years, six seven years on a, a new history of graphic design, um, <clears throat> which I'm. Um, now, actually, in the in, in the in the process of kind of rethinking a bit, given uh, kind of events, especially in the United States over the past year, and, and in terms of what exactly is included and how that should be structured, um, given the kind of the history of um, you know uh, you know the work of of uh, people of color, uh, indigenous people, um, having been overlooked uh, or written out completely. Um, and trying to think a little bit less, uh, less uh, kind of centered on on kind of the European American canon, and bringing those kinds of influences in, so that has kind of disturbed <clears throat> the kind of trajectory uh, a bit. Um, but the the primary goal there was was to uh, present history in a very very visual way, in a much more conceptual way that wasn't so much about sort of celebrating these individual kind of heroes or heroines, um, uh, but just sort of looking at the form language and really looking at it um, uh, from a kind of a semiotic standpoint, um, not as a kind of a uh, a progression of styles, but visual form as a kind of a signature for a culture's mindset or a kind of a cultural kind of underpinning. Um, so, I, so the, the thing that I've always found with uh, the existing histories is that they're very strictly factual. Um, uh, some more recent ones uh, have started to dig into the kind of the socio-political aspects of design, design as a social act, and um, sort of the context surrounding it, but never really talk about form, um, which I think is the kind of the, the interesting thing about what it is that we do. Um, um, yes, we're planners and problem solvers and um, uh, conveyors of information, and we, we bind community, and we are recording things and celebrating things, um, but there is a, the, you know, the, the, the underlying aspect of what we do is that we take sort of the intangibles <laughs> and give them some kind of visual form, um, whatever that happens to be, uh, and uh, and there's an organizational process. Uh, and I, um, the one thing that I always wondered, um, which was never really made clear to me, and and which none of these books really deal with, is the, what's the relationship between uh, kind of stylistic gestures uh, or formal gestures that occur at any given time, and what are they expressing about that designers or that movement's kind of sort of cultural surrounding, um, and the history that's that's kind of steadily being built into that. Um, so uh, just trying to position it in a, in a very different way, um, but that uh, that that project will probably take me another ten years by the time I by the time. I, I get through it. Um, I have a lot of uh, a lot of new research that I need to to do um, in order to um, you know sort of broaden uh, its scope, uh, which I think is an important thing to do and really needs to be done. Um, I, my one of my goals at the time, you know, from the beginning of that process, was to be much more inclusive and not you know sort of strictly focus on um, 
it can't be Europeans and Americans, but to be able to bring these other voices in. Uh, and now that that is extremely top of mind, now it means really, really rethinking that. It's not just about, you know, adding some additional people and saying, okay, here they are, but, um, and here's their work, but really trying to, you know, find kind of the sources of those things, um, to debug some myths, to kind of decenter, um, decenter the whiteness, as it were. Um, so that's a, it's a very, very interesting thing. I've, just in the past, um, in the past uh, three or four months, I've come across some uh, new sources that have really blown my mind, things that I have no idea about. Um, so it's very, you know, it's a, it's, it's a very enjoyable and kind of uh, illuminating process uh, to, to dig into those kinds of things uh, after. Um, and then I'm working on a, uh, a kind of a, a sort of a visual anthropology uh, project. Um, one of the questions that has kind of surfaced for me, um, especially given recent events, the kind of assumptions that one makes or assumptions that one has been handed uh, as a result of one's education um, about the way seeing works, about the way the, the brain constructs meaning out of what is seen. Um, uh, I'm ex kind of exploring, uh, kind of, or attempting to, whether or not these kind of universal kind of perceptual truths that I was taught uh, exist, actually exist, and whether or not humans across the board, um, uh, you know, from whatever culture, region, background, and so on, respond to visual form um, in kind of similar ways. Uh, in, um, in a number of my classes, uh, I've introduced um, abstraction as part of the, uh, the curriculum um, you know, for particular projects, and usually as a, a kind of a jumping off point. Um, we'll do a little exercise and do what I like to call a game of sorts, but it's a very, very kind of deep and profound game, uh, or it struck me that way. I would mean, uh, tell students to, you know, assemble a bunch of materials and then to you know, just take a small paper, piece of paper. And we talk about abstraction and what it is and the, the value, you know, uh, what the tool brings to it, what gesture brings to it, what the kind of mark making um, uh, brings to kind of meaning and, and so on. So I ask them to visualize um, uh, an emotion. Uh, usually I start with rage uh, because it's kind of intuitive. Everybody kind of understands that feeling. And it is very, very human, um, very animalistic, um, kind of an emotion that kind of transcends uh, time and, and culture uh, and place. Um, and so I have them visualize that in a completely abstract way. And then I ask them to then, you know, it's like a 30 second exercise. And then I say, we're going to do that again, but this time visualize comfort. And the responses, the visual responses in terms of their forms are very, very different than what happens in the first exercise. And so we have a conversation about that. And so I began to wonder, you know, where's the, where are the commonalities in visual language? And is, is there some truth to that? Uh, assumption that uh, humans will interpret visual marks um, uh, in interacting in a space in a kind of a common way, you know, something that we can that we can trade on um, to be able to generate meaning, um, uh, you know, kind of purposely um, and in a reliable way. Uh, and then at the same time, where where do you cross that boundary, where the mark making or the response to visual form becomes much more kind of personal? Um, and I think that those two, those two kind of extremes of the uh, sort of emotional condition or emotional state sort of surface that uh, in, a, in, a, in a really clear way um, that I find really fascinating. So the, um, in, that, in that exercise, all of the rage, the responses to rage are nearly identical. Um, they're very, very dark, very aggressive, very angular, miss, you know, constantly redirecting kinds of marks that are jiggity jaggeting back and forth and punching into each other. And sometimes the paper gets crumpled and ripped and <clears throat> spattered. It's very explosive. But the, mar the, the visual language, the form is, is nearly identical. When you look at the, uh, the compositions that uh, respond to comfort, uh, it's a much wider range. Um, generally, the forms tend to be softer, much more curvilinear, um, but then there are deviations uh, within that uh, uh, sort of general 
sort of quality, uh, there are repetitions, uh, a single form being repeated over and over again, several forms interacting together to make not disparate things, but a kind of uh, a totality, a kind of a um, sort of a unified mass. Um, there are a lot of kind of womb and cloud-like shapes, um, uh, things that are very, very singular. Um, uh, and so the, all of those kinds of, of those kinds of uh, visual responses point to ideas of certainty and of softness. So they're, but they're, but they they do tend to kind of vary. And so I think that there's a um, my my take on that or my interpretation of that is that the notion of comfort is more highly individualized, based on each person's kind of. Um, emotional background their emotional life the where they you know where they've come from um whereas rage is kind of universal it cuts right to the core of, of what it is to be a human um so i think that there's a really really interesting kind of um study on there so i'm, I'm building um a kind of a, a visual questionnaire um that i'm uh will be delivered uh, online um and um what i'm hoping is that the data that i'm able to gather will give me some um you know, some way of understanding, um, either supporting or completely debunking uh, the kinds of uh, uh, ideas that I was introduced to uh, about the way the film works, about seeing and perception and cognition and sort of the semiotics of that that I was that I was um, introduced to uh, in school. And then I've operated under it as, as a given. Um, you know, we always talk about, you know, communicating universally, um, especially coming out of that kind of... Uh, this sort of Swiss background, you know, what it is, it, what is it to be international or to be neutral, uh, which we know is now is a total myth. But I think that as, as a kind of an aspirational goal, it's quite lovely <clears throat> to be able to speak to everyone um, uh, in a very, very inclusive and very authentic uh, and deep kind of way. Um, but you know that 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 does you know beg the question: um, whose universality are we talking about? Um, and is that filtered through, clearly filtered through a particular um, sort of cultural uh, bias? Um, so I want to see if that's really true. Um, I'm hoping it is. I mean, I think that there'd be something nice about that. And that the other, in the other, um, I'm also very, very interested to see what kinds of responses deviate uh, from uh, what my expectations are, um, because I think that would be really, really, uh, really interesting. Um, you know, how does someone from a completely different culture, a completely different upbringing, background, different language base, um, respond to uh, a certain kind of visual form um, differently. And then to kind of interrogate that, like, why is that? And what is the relationship between one's kind of cultural mindset, the influence of one's um, you know, native language and how it frames, um, you know, a, our sense of reality? Um, because our, our sense of reality is is very much framed by the way our language works um and and, and what's the effect of that i think that there's i think there's a lot of really interesting um uh you know, knowledge to be gained by that so hopefully within the next year or so uh, i'll get that together i have to figure out how i'm going to program it and that sounds really like exciting that. yeah 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 we'll see and you know, fingers crossed <laughs> i blow up in my face i have no idea so <laughs> Over, over the course of your teaching um, and right now, uh, what do you see the greatest challenges in art and design education at the moment? Um, well, the greatest, well, the greatest challenges. Uh, I think there are, um, there are a couple. Uh, one is uh, something that has resulted from the kind of the democratization of image making that occurred uh, that initially started with uh, desktop publishing and uh, and then kind of was exaggerated by uh, the appearance of the internet and that is the kind of um, the kind of the Google search of of image creation. Um, sort of templating of things, kind of that that sort of level of systematization. Um, uh, and so the, I, I generally find it is very difficult to overcome students' urge to uh, simply you know, go online, find an appropriate image, plunk it down, stick some type on top of it, um, or to you know, take a template and then you know for uh, something and or a mock-up <clears throat> you know, for presenting something. So I think that, that fighting that kind of um, that sort of mechanized quality uh, where the 
the communication is no longer really authentically original. It might be adjusted in some ways, but I think that there's a, a kind of a, um, it interferes with uh, students kind of development of a kind of a core uh, way of seeing, a core way of, of generating ideas from within um, in a creative way. Um, so that's one. Um, uh, and I guess that would pretty much be it. Uh, and, and, but in, in general, I think that there's been, um, over the past few decades, uh, kind of a diminishing of the discussion of, of form or the investigation of form, form making, not just for its own sake, of course, because there is no form making for its own sake. Um, but the kind of um, the sort of the rigorous uh, attention to um, the characteristics of form and what it is to refine something, uh, to be, to make that form clear, um, to choose it, uh, uh, to choose it well for uh, a, a given intention, um, and to be able to kind of finesse that thing, to craft that form in a um, <clears throat> in a in a way. You know, this brings up, all, of course, all kinds of loaded terms like, you know, is this form beautiful or not? Is it refined or not? Is it clear or not? Um, uh, I, I like to think that there is some standard of quality, if we can even uh, apply that word. See, that, that even is a, a loaded term, because what is, you know, what denotes that quality? I would say the, the, the form is a one of quality when it, when it does the job that it needs to do, um, you know, when it, when it expresses whatever that um, whatever is, is intended to be expressed, but then there's on top of that, there's also a <clears throat> there's a there's a refinement uh, to that thing, and I, I don't mean the kind of cleaning up, um, but of the sort of the massaging of that form to be as much like itself as it can be, um, if that makes sense. So you know, you you know the things that are that we might say are very oh, those are very ugly aggressive disjointed form you know it's not smooth and fluid and organic and um, um, clean and sharp it's like that that form can itself be refined in that way to make it more that way so that it, it um, yeah, assuming that it has some kind of role to play um, so I think that's the that's the thing that kind of drives me the most I mean that's the reason I got into design or into art in general is because I'm, I'm fascinated by form um, you know, what we do with it. Um, and it is, you know, the form making is, you know, kind of one of those things that is so innately human. Um, uh, and, and, uh, you know, intuitively human, uh, unavoidably human. Um, cause it goes back, um, you know, several hundred thousand years, uh, you know, this urge to somehow mark things for whatever, for whatever purpose, um, maybe initially only for uh, the identification um, of something or um, to denote ownership. Um, uh, but um, it is, it, it, it's one thing that we do that no other animal does in, in that sense. You know, there are animals that create kind of, I suppose, symbolic gestures. You know, the bower bird builds a certain kind of a nest um, in an, and, and there are there are aesthetic qualities to it that clearly attract females to that male's nest over those nests of made by other male bower birds. So there is you know there is that kind of symbolic use. I don't know that we can that we know enough about the minds of how um, uh, animals work, um, but it seems that you know they have some emotional life and potentially some some symbolic life. Uh, as well, but you know, as far as we're concerned, um, and we can be biased about it. You know, humans do that. We make we make images, um, signs, and symbols, and no other species really does that in the way that we do. Uh, and that's that, that for me is like okay, there's a whole there's a whole lifetime of exploration there. Um, absolutely, absolutely. So, how can we help students rediscover the beauty of that refinement of form? I think it just it involves time. Uh, and um, because it is it is time intensive that study, uh, and it needs to be it needs to be given uh, a really liberal amount of space uh, in order to um, to allow it to happen, to allow that seeing to, to happen naturally um, in the student, um, to be able to come to conclusions about it, to test even. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's a lot of testing. It's like, you know, you make 10,000 things and then you compare them. The comparison, you know, sifting through um, a variety of, you know, kind of output, you know, it didn't get a bunch of marks, a bunch of compositions, a bunch of dots arranged or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and to be able to discuss and to, um, to kind of assimilate you know, what are the kinds of responses that people have to those things, what are your own responses? Um, and, when, and then further to be able to isolate, you know, something that is viable, has an idea that's appealing to the, to the maker, maybe appealing to others that exhibits a certain kind of a logic. It's like, how do you, how do you tease that out? It takes time. Um, uh, and I think that the, the challenge there is that there are so many things that need to be taught in a really or time frame um, uh, that 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 study tends to get short shrift because there are all these other kinds of there you know, technological things you know programming and um, you know UX design and um, the various media um, as well as you know then there's typography and then there's you know <laughs> um, there are so many there are so many parts uh, moving parts in play. Um, and I think that, you know, the tools that um, the digital workspace uh, provides make it seem like form making is easy. Uh, you know, you, you click a couple of buttons, you change a brush, you know, it's, it's done. But it's not really done. On the surface, it's done. You can, you can arrive very quickly at something that seems acceptable. Um, but then I think as you start to pick it apart, it, it you know, it reveals its weakness um, underneath is that it, it is, it becomes just kind of surface styling. And this is the thing that always, that always, you know, kind of gets my goat um, is that, you know, those of the postmodern persuasion, you know, have been railing, you know, for decades about, you know, this kind of surface style, um, yeah, how form is just, you know, it's just, it's just on the surface. And that what they're really after is getting to this kind of this, this underlying kind of authenticity, um, and bringing people's voices out and making material with meaning that has connectivity and resonance uh, with audiences and, and deals with its context and so on. Um, and so in, in, in focusing so much on these other kinds of, uh, of issues is that they've actually kind of driven us to a place where the form becomes kind of meaningless. It becomes kind of a service activity where it becomes so, so personal in its, um, in its expression that it's no longer connecting with others. Um, it requires, you know, advanced reading in order to uh, understand, you know, what is being expressed. What is the the designer's intention? You know, even if a designer is an author, can be an author. Sure, that's totally fine. Um, and is generating meaning themselves. It's it's the um, I think one of the things that's very very specific about design is is the dialogue and this connection with with um, kind of the group at large. Yeah. There's a there's an um, uh, a kind of a requirement. Um, that is part of design that is not part of what we, I guess, traditionally consider fine art making. Um, the, fine art, the fine art maker makes and doesn't really care and hopes that there is this kind of resonance um, with others, this kind of connection. Um, the designer is, you know, coming out of an industrial background where, okay, you're getting paid for a result. Um, is that 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 the purposefulness, the decisiveness, and that intent, and the the, the result of the outcome, is is very very important um, it, within kind of design thinking. I hate that term. Um, also, uh, so many buzzwords that I just have to go to because they're they're floating around. And, you know, you can't avoid them. Um, but the, but that 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 the perception that there is a a, a user who's going to interface with this thing that's being made and has to get something out of it. Um, and that we want them to get out of it the thing that we intend them to get out of it. This is very, very specific to designing. It's about program, much the way, okay. you know, the use of spaces in architecture Absolutely. is that architects don't design, you know, for no reason, um, you know, to express themselves. They, you know, that there's functionality involved. I think that there's like, the, there's a kind of a, kind of a big difference that there's a, there's a user. Um, it's a it's an interesting thing, and this is you know um, it dovetails with uh, it's a very very Swiss kind of idea as um, sachlichkeit, 
which is this kind of this reverence for um, or this directing of purpose for the greater good for those around you. Um, that there's a rightness to the thing that you that one is making in the context of you know what are the expectations of others or what uh, around you will you be actually be contributing something um, uh, to making their lives better to making them able to do something in a better way. Um, uh, and I think that's a that's a kind of um, is it's a it's a, a a really you know kind of noble goal, um, and I think the form is part of that. It's a thing that makes the thing uh, enjoyable. It makes the thing understandable. It makes the thing useful, um, uh, and it, it's what designers are interested in. I would I would guess. I mean, most designers, and students are like, oh, it looks really cool. Well, that's okay, great. Um, yes, it does. Um, why does it look so cool? Why why do we have this kind of response to it? It's kind of cognitive harmony that results from looking or you know, kind of interacting with something in a particular way. Um, and that can be you know, something that's physical as well, you know, three-dimensional, or it's a package, or it's uh, you know, some kind of a product or uh, a printed work or something that's screen-based. Um, you know, why, why is that visual experience so compelling in this context for this purpose? Um, so there's a, there's a synergy that has to be found there. And I, uh, I think the form is the thing that, that does that. Do you think students are more excited about the result rather than enjoying the journey, the, the process? Oh, yeah, always. They just want to get there. That's, what's... <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. You know, the, uh, yes, it's always about the, the end result, um, especially because they're, very, they're of course, very deadline-minded. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and, of course, the thing that's driving it is, is the grade. Um, so I, I often wonder about whether or not our whole kind of system of grading ought to be thrown out the window. And it, it happens in places, um, uh, you know, where you, you don't actually have an ending point. You study and study, and then you get to a point, and then you evaluate it based on that study, and then you can continue to the next level, to the next stage, um, or you don't. And then you continue to study and so on. And then eventually, you know, it might be two years, it might be five years, you know, you, you know it clicks. Um, is at some level of mastery. Yeah, it's the removal of failure. It's, it's right, right, failure. right, right, right. Yeah, that's uh, and I, I think that's a terrible thing. Um, yes. The failure is a learning is a learning Absolutely. device. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, it, uh, trust me, I've been there. Um, you know, and it's a, it's a good it's a good learning device. I mean, you, you see what does not work, and then you say, okay, that totally sucked. Um, so now, what do I do? So I, I'm not going to do that again. Um, and what else is there? Um, and that also that failure also spurs looking in other um, in other directions. You know, so it forces you to kind of exhaust what you know, or what you think you know already, and then to try to find some new avenue. And this is where new invention kicks in. Um, but it is a, you know the, the process of it is the is the is the thing. It's like it grows. The end the outcome is the expression and the manifestation of a process of thinking. Um, and it's it's you know trying to trying to kind of subvert um, that that end goal obsession uh, and get students to really kind of enjoy not knowing what they're doing and making you know a lot of different things to try to find out well what do I what do I see here um, maybe I don't see anything and then I have to keep going again. Um, so of course, you know, there's this forced iteration in the in the process. Um, you know, make 20 variations on this. Make 20. You know, make 20 more. Pick one. Pick two. Put the. You know, and it's it, for them. I think it, it it becomes very often this kind of. You know, I think somewhere along the way they sort of get it, but it's usually it usually the impression that I get is that it strikes them as more or less busy work. Like you're just filling time. Like can we just get to the point? already uh, you know, you know, uh, humans are very um, lazy creatures uh, hmm. yeah whatever is the easiest route we're going to take um, and they want to take it uh, and so they can so I always throw a few I always throw a few wrenches at the works as I go I suddenly you know the project will suddenly make a left turn um, or I'll throw in a new a new variable that they weren't expecting just a oh I can't do that now I guess not. <laughs> and then, you know, that actually had, I mean, that happens in a very, very practical way in a professional context. Yes, um, you know, if you, 
if you've ever worked with a client of any kind, you know, somewhere along the way, they've approved things and then suddenly something changes. Um, you know, it's suddenly the, you know, the brochure is, is only eight pages instead of 12 and you've got to fit the same stuff in, or you need to add a bunch of things or some new functionalities uh, on the web page, and, and you have to be able to turn on a dime and be like, how do I incorporate the stuff that I've already done that exploration, uh, and then kind of redirect it, um, uh, uh, and build off of it. There might need to be new things. Um, so it's not a total loss, but, uh, um, um, you know, those kind of curveballs come. So I think it's useful to, um, it's useful on two levels that, you know, throwing, you know, so throwing some kind of unexpected um, uh, event into the process uh, is good for one, you know, just sort of forcing them to not rest on their laurels and become complacent. Uh, and, uh, and two, it, it's also a good, you know, kind of training for what will happen, what's likely to happen in the project, you know, when they're really working. Um, so I like to mix you know, those kind of practical things in uh, as well. It's not all just, you know, kind of theoretical and, you know, sort of feel good, one and fuzzy, you know, anthropological kind of higher, higher consciousness kind of stuff. It's like there is, you know, the day-to-day -day practice of it. What, what are the greatest challenges you faced during the past couple of years in, in teaching and learning? Um, I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's those things, really the loss of time, um, more stuff being crammed into the same amount of, of time or very often reduced time. For, for um, is, yeah, yeah. I mean, just so that, you know, the sort of contact hours. And, yes. and, I, I, and I mean this not in the, um, in the context of COVID, yeah, yeah. Um, which made everything worse. Um, <clears throat> uh, because time works in a totally different way when you're on a screen. Um, but that's the that's the that that's probably the biggest thing is that each kind of thing that needs to be understood doesn't seem to have enough time to really understand it. Mm -hmm. um, as students are getting a kind of a service level, like my my undergraduate classes were six hour studios, mm -hmm. um, and um, at an institution where I'm teaching now, they were six hour studios, and then about five years ago, they got cut to four hours, and that was that was devastating. Um, and I noticed uh, uh, it was immediate, uh, the outcomes suffered. Uh, and it was one of the reasons that I had begun teaching there was because, oh, here's an institution that really gets it. I don't actually think six hours is enough. I'd prefer an eight hour, of course, uh, an eight hour class, um, maybe fewer classes, more in depth, uh, and possibly for longer um, period, you know, longer durations, not just a, a semester. Um, but it's it's time is the is the issue. Everything's so fast, so fast, so fast, so fast. And everyone is. I think it, it makes people really, um, really anxious. Um, and it's it's disturbing. It's like everything's got to be like done like right now. Um, and we get we we're so used to this, you know, kind of constant um, pace, uh, a very very frenetic pace. Yeah, you know, everything from you know, the 24 hour news cycle to um, you've got to complete your studies in four years, you've got to get a job right away, you've got to, you know, move up the ranks, you've got to be, you know, it's like a you know, everybody just needs to relax. Relax. I'm looking for some kind of you know, kind of the, the slowing down of design, the way that you know slow food happened. Mm -hmm. Um and I, I'm not finding I mean you see it here and there, you know, the kind of the the resurgence of interest in like letterpress and you know other kinds of hand making of things calligraphy uh, you know those the, there are you know you can see that pushback um happening um it just doesn't seem to be happening at a, at a large scale and not yet in the institutional um, yes. framework um so so if you had a kind of a magic wand if there were no limitations what what would you change <laughs> uh, where do I start? <laughs> the, um, I think at the um, I, I think the first off is that I would I would um, most I mean if we're gonna, if we're going to stick to the four year um, the four year uh, you know you can do anything structure there's no I don't have to no I, may, I I I would make it a kind of an open end study um, mm. with with some kind of you know sort of benchmarking along the way. Um, I mean, you can't study forever. Of course, you could. 
um, if you could afford to. Unless you're studying but, design. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, you could, you could. I mean, you're always studying afterwards. It's like you never stop learning. But I mean, I, mean, I think just in terms of of developing a well-rounded and and uh, competent, um, uh, an effective individual, an effective visual voice, and uh, uh, kind of you know sort of fluencies in in those things. So you, you know, probably five six years, I think, would be around what I would imagine uh, it would need to be. Um, fewer classes maybe not uh you know kind of the enormous breaks in between like a uh, you know spring and fall semester um but not at the but also not at the pace that uh requires that kind of a break you know i think one of the reasons that we have these breaks um is because you know we're, we're you know cramming so much stuff into students heads like maybe they're going to burn out um and if they're able to you know kind of explore at um at a pace that where it, where it remains enjoyable and where they're actually able to assimilate and to to really understand, come to understanding, um, is that they may not need a break. In fact, they might not want one. Um, uh, you know, of, of that length, yeah, you, you have to have some breaks on occasion or other kinds of activities that could also be built in, um, which could involve, you know, sort of writing, could involve you know, sort of outdoor, you know, observation, hiking and walking and, you know, looking at things and discussion, um, uh, you know, that it's not just all making, 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 making all the time. So I think that bringing some kind of element of the environment to play um, uh, in, into the uh, classroom, um, if you want to call it that, um, would be useful. But I think a few were classes where you, where you go through, a, um, you proceed through a series of, of very carefully calculated kind of stages of, you know, from, from simpler kind of isolated kinds of um, activity, uh, certain kinds of thinking, uh, and then kind of merging those together in a kind of a scaffolded way over time, which I think most most design programs you know, do that um, or attempt to do that somehow, um, that there is this kind of um, sort of progressive nature uh, in the structure uh, of, of the curriculum. So it's just it's so jam-packed. Um, but, I, you know, you know, maybe grading is not the... Um, I would probably remove the grading. Uh, you know, it's like, let's get to a point, let's see where you arrive, and then we can talk about what you've come to understand, and then are you going to move into other areas, into another area? And I don't know that it needs, that the education needs to be so kind of linearly directed either. Um, you know, the, again, the end goal, you're going to be a designer. Um, it may be limiting. Um, maybe, maybe it needs to be more of a, you're going to explore kind of the things that you want to explore, and you might move through you know, what are kind of distinct uh, or back and forth among kind of distinct discipline areas, um, uh, but then kind of to self-direct towards, you know, kind of an, uh, an area of inquiry, an area of, of, of creation that appeals, um, you know, that, that really resonates with the student rather than say, okay, you're going to come out with you know, a BFA in graphic design. Because that in itself kind of, you know, sort of closes off you're kind of thinking about well, what what is what is the kind of the practice that I'm going to engage in? This is a, a question that often comes up, or something that, that um, I think I and you know some of my my, my colleagues struggle with, uh, is that the um, the profession is framed in a particular way. Like, what is the kind of practice that happens? Um, but we find a lot of um, interest and desire among students to practice design in ways that are not conventionally understood as design, things that involve kind of installation making or public artwork, you know, we're, which have names in other disciplines, but, um, you know, where there's, you know, some kind of hybridization can occur. Um, they can kind of make something, um, make their practice be what they want it to be. Uh, and so when we get towards the tail end of the, uh, you know, the curriculum, uh, the second half of the junior year and the first half of the senior year, we begin to talk about kind of the realities the world are going to face and what, what, what practice is. Um, very often we're talking about, okay, well, you're going to go get a job at a studio and you're going to be doing, you know, websites and brochures and you're going to do corporate identity and, um, you know, and there's not, and, and but then there are also, you know, people that really want to do kind of like what we would 
may be referred to as photojournalism, um, where we're you know, kind of merging kind of creative writing and the visual expression in a way that's you know what we might call visual literature or concrete poetry, um, uh, or they may want to engage in um, engage with fashion designers and collaborate in terms of textile uh, patterning or um, you know three dimensional work and and all of those skills are translatable but we 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 create this kind of tend to create this kind of pipeline um you know in a very very you know sort of to cast design practice in a relatively narrow way um and it's a difficult thing to to kind of get out of um especially if you've been working for some time uh in that in that kind of context so um you know sometimes it, it's difficult for me to kind of jump out of the kind of the realm of my experience, which is initially very, very corporate or you know, very, very conventional kind of studio based um, commercially driven practice and to kind of envision, well, what is like, how are you going to make a living doing that? <laughs> you know, because you know, the making a living apart is kind of important. Um, people have to be able to live in the world and do what they want to do and not and not um, relegate their their practice to like after hours like i'm going to go work uh, you know kind of a day job and then you know just to pay my bills and then i'm kind of squishing my practice onto weekends and nights and that's not healthy um it doesn't help anybody and nobody wants to do that um uh so the, the, the question is you know how do you how do you how do you walk that line um that's a that's kind of challenging um i think uh, and it's it's it, it, it's a very very interesting question because you know since the appearance of desktop publishing, the, the kind of the the accessibility uh, to to tools, to software, to um, uh, you know even if you did not come from kind of a painting and drawing kind of a traditional sort of handicraft background, you didn't own how those skills is that your eyes and your brain can still work, uh, and you should be able to. Um, you know, to engage with design practice, um, not being able to draw, for example, not being able to paint, not being able to make prints and so on. Um, do I think it's helpful? Yeah, totally. Um, but it, but that also becomes a kind of a gatekeeping, like, oh, only this kind of special group um, with well, that particular kind of, kind of talent. You kind of is, have to, though, see visually and have a, a yeah, yeah, hard yeah, eye yeah. coordination. I mean, you, you know, it's like, you know, if you're doing study chemistry, you know your table of elements. If you're doing... Uh, if you're a journalist, you write. If you're visual, studying visual communication, <laughs> you need to have right. an understanding. Right, you have to be able to see, and you have yes. to be able to, to. You have to be able to to think about. Um, you have to be able to think about what you're seeing, how you're seeing it, and to pick apart what your brain does with the seeing of it, and then sort of what's the kind of the intellectual response that results after that. Um, and, and yeah, there is you know, in terms of creating that kind of connection between the form making, the making of form and the seeing, the, you know, the hand is, is, you know, there, there, nothing's going to uh, change that. I mean, that's, that's, that's the main conduit, but I don't think it's totally necessary. I mean, there, you know, history is, is rife with examples of people who could not draw who became um, uh, exquisite designers um, and produce very, very profound work. And we're not able, you know, we're not able to draw, couldn't you know, draw, you know, draw a stick figure. Um, if their life depended on it, and I think I, I think it's fine. You see, it's the seeing is, is the thing that, that makes it different. Of course. Um, especially as as the making of form becomes easier, at least in a physical way, for everyone. Um, you know, using uh, you know using software, um, it's that it's the seeing and the thinking about that seeing that becomes the defining characteristic of the designer. Um, because you know, like I said. Uh, a, a, an eight-year-old with little, you know, little artistic um, skill, really, or even native talent, or even training, uh, if you get such a thing anymore in in school, you know, can you know open up Photoshop, open up Illustrator, and make some very, very interesting and beautiful things. The question is, what is that happening in a kind of a naive way? Um, uh, you know, what is the purpose of that, and then how is that how is that making being directed? Um, uh, so I think that there's, you know, it, it, um, as much as the, as much as software allows for, you know, potentially a certain kind of level of mediocrity, 
um, it also does allow a lot of people who formerly may not have even imagined that they had access to a certain kind of creativity uh, to be able to to engage in that kind of activity um, in, a, in a way which I think is is nice. You know, the more the more voices, uh, the more the, the better. Um, but I think that that also then it also means that understanding how to see. Um, what seeing really is, and and being able to to interrogate and analyze form and and how it works on our uh, consciousness as a, as a stimulus as an input um, becomes you know re- really makes a designer a designer. Right? It's not that you can it's not that you can make the image necessarily. That of course is a plus. Um, it's that you know what that image is going to do. Um, you know what its content is is doing. What what effect it's going to have uh on its uh on the recipient uh or on the other the other end of the of the of the conversation um and then it's going to accomplish what one is hoping that it's going to accomplish so i think that that's the that's the, i think really where uh design educators really need to, to focus is on the understanding of form um uh and how that you know how it communicates um because it's it's I say this sometimes and people look at me like a, I've got three heads. Um, I think the, the idea that form is, is simply a vehicle for content, I think is, is misguided. Form is content. You know, we, we understand things because of the way they look. Um, because we're, we're optical creatures. Um, most, of, most of our world, uh, we, 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 we identify, we differentiate, we parcel out. Um, we invent relationships between things that we observe in the world around us through our eyes. Um, uh, and we can manipulate what it is that we are seeing. So, uh, and that's what designers do. We manipulate uh, vi- the visual experience. Um, and so in order to do that in a way that makes sense and that, that is also kind of, you know, might rise to the level of, of beauty, whatever that means. Again, just to throw another loaded term in there. Um, I think that, that that's what makes the designer the designer, um, and that's where that's where uh, I think educators really need to concentrate. Um, you know, all those other things are important, but you know, here's the thing: is that like uh, my my education was incredibly form based, um, but all these other things that that have become so important about you know uh, uh, designing as a social act. Um, Designing for inclusivity, designing for usability, uh, designing um, as an author, uh, uh, designing, um, uh, you know, whether it's problem solving or not, you know, all these other issues, you know, how context matters, um, how the audience matters, that it's not a one way street, um, you know, it is a dialogue, um, the construction of meaning, like all of that, somehow we were taught anyway. In addition, because that was that was what the, the goal was. Like, this is what you're supposed to be doing, but you need this. You need these skills to be able to do that. Because you had the uh, time. You had a long studio. You had meditations. Right. Yeah, had, we had we, had we had the time. Like, um, like 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 I had, of course. Yeah. Of course. You mentioned again on the subject of time. You mentioned that the screen uh, changes the perception of time, and there's a. Um, is a great. Uh, I think one of the greatest challenges that we are facing right now uh, is how to help stu- uh, students uh, get work experience um, in this in this climate, where they have to be more isolated, where they not necessarily can be part of a, of a of a physical company. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, what would be your uh, advice on on, on that? Um. Can you ask me that question again? Sure, sure. It's about uh, how do we, how can we best assist students uh, get work experience? Like you know, in, like you said, you know, you were you know in, in the studio, you had you know all this. We, we both had time in studios and in agencies and in the real world, and you know. But right now, it's not so easy for students to access physical environments. Right. Well, I mean, hopefully, hopefully, um, you know, that's that that's going to change, uh, and it is changing, um, at least here in the United States, um, relatively rapidly. So we're gonna um, we're gonna be teaching in person um, in the fall, 
Uh, so that that will, um, I think, fix that. <laughs> but I think that you know there is going to be there is always going to be this this um, some component probably of of learning that is remote. Um, no, no, we will be teaching based. in full. But what about students getting experience in companies that might not be? That, that might not, not yeah, be. Yeah, there's yeah. a there's a that's a that's a good um, a good question. I think that the trying to trying to maximize what is the, the, the kind of the collaborative or the potential for the collaborative aspect of uh, uh, of the screen based environment like Zoom um, becomes really really important. Um, one of the things that I found so for me the way that the way that that the screen changes time is that it makes it very kind of singularly focused. It's a very um, the audience becomes receptive, um, and in conversation with an individual student, it becomes uh, it becomes almost a, a one way sort of back and forth kind of conduit where others around are not really they can't really engage. And so time kind of stops for them until they are engaged. Um, whereas in the in the physical environment, you can be having a conversation with a student, but because you're in a group, is that others can you know it's it's easier and also more intuitive for people to toss in a comment or to overlap each other um, to redirect um, to to draw out uh, kind of uh, insights um, responses reactions uh, in a weird way so I found that the um, um, the thing that is useful there is a kind of the um, the sort of the breakout room uh, kind of function yeah. um, and also things like uh, mural uh, where yeah. multiple people can be looking at a source and commenting simultaneously or even interacting with it, pushing stuff around, writing notes, annotating, and so on, um, where it's not just, you know, looking at each other, uh, you know, in, in this kind of box, <laughs> uh, or even screen sharing, which is which is also in the box. Um, uh, it's a, it's a, so I think that there's a, there's a, a collaborative kind of sort of activity that helps to mitigate some of the, the sort of disconnected quality. Um, and this kind of weird stopping and starting of time that happens um, in the, you know, through the screen. Um, so I, I think that, you know, if, if uh, yeah, students are, are at the point where they're getting internships and they're working, that, that, that kind of defies the whole, the whole internship sort of experience is the screen based thing because you're supposed to be in that place, you know, kind of interacting and seeing what's going on. Exactly. So that you can't really see that. So I think that there's, you know, uh, I think that this would depend a lot on the individual studio that's hosting. Um, that is to have some kind of a webcam that's directed into the into the studio space so that student can be working and that there is this kind of concentrate like it's a uh, like you're actually seeing what's going on there. It's always very, very interesting. Um, uh, like if you go to you know, certain designers' websites and they have a you know, they have a cam uh, that's you know showing what's going on in the studio, the sound is off or there's a soundtrack playing or something. But you can actually see people moving around and you know talking to each other and so on. Um, I think if there was you know, some kind of um, some kind of sharing of, of that nature, that that might be helpful. But you know if, if nobody's if there is no actual physical space, um, I think it's it, it's kind of difficult. To, um, I don't. I don't really know that I have a uh, a really good solution for that. Other than that, it you have to introduce um, force, uh, kind of collaborative conversations, uh, collaborative activity through something like mural. Um, you know, where it's not just you know you go away for three hours, you do some work, and then you come back and you meet again, and then you show stuff, yeah. and you go away and then, yeah. you know, but that where you're actually working uh, kind of together. Mm -hmm. But that that necessitates then an additional you know an additional time component. Um, because you you do need you know, um, you know some time to work independently, um, so now you're you know, you're forcing uh, there to be two different kinds of working periods. Um, but I, you know I don't know. I mean, hopefully, um, hopefully that you know that that, that will change. Um, yeah, you know, things are going to go back to you know, to normal, uh, so to speak. But I mean, um, how can our viewers? Uh... How can our viewers and listeners find you? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> how can they find me? Uh, well, I, I am on LinkedIn. Um, so and it's the only kind of social media that I do. So it's, it's just been sort of good for networking. I don't, I'm not a Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Um, 
I have my reasons. Uh, my website has been in, in constru- under construction for I don't know how long. Because as, as you know, you know, just like the, the, the cobbler's children uh, have no shoes, um, the designer has no, <laughs> has no website. Um, you know, the designer is, is, uh, is her own worst client um, in terms of getting things done. So I keep like making it and then um, I get sidetracked by things and then, okay. uh, and then I don't like it. And then I sort of start remaking it. Um, we're trying to um, cure myself of that, that bad habit. Uh, so hopefully soon. Um, but uh, uh, if people are interested in finding my books, um, you can actually just Google me. Um, there are some lectures that I've done, some presentations uh, where there's video of that. Um, uh, at the Type Directors Club, uh, for example, a couple of years ago. Um, uh, I have courses on Creative Live, um, which is uh, out in California. Uh, and I'm actually developing some new um, courses uh, for them as well. Uh, and um, my publisher, um, uh, you can find my books. Um, so if you provide a link to my my author's page, um, and my publisher, which is uh, Quarto um, or Rockport, they're a, uh, a division of Quarto Publishing, um, that's where they can find me for the most part. Um, hopefully, in the near future, that website will be up, and I'll I'll be a little bit more public facing. But right, yeah. it's for some reason it's never really like at the top of my priority list. <laughs> Uh, like if somebody wants to get in touch with me, I'm sure they're going to find me somehow. So you know, it's uh, it, it's more of a you know kind of a weird word of mouth. Do you know how to <laughs> or email address or how I can? Every now and then I get a kind of a, like a random um, a random email through my one of my school emails. Somebody finds you know, oh, he's teaching there, so I'll I'll find his his, his school email, uh, and then I, I find it um, eventually. Sometimes it's you know a couple of weeks later, but. Yeah, hopefully the website will be up in your future. Brilliant. It's so terrible. Not really setting a good example, I suppose. But what is the the advice you'd like to leave us with? Um, really do what you got to do. Uh, I think that the um, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, um, looking for answers um, among students, among even designers who are self teaching. Um, looking for you kind of external input, you know, how do I do this? Show me the way. Um, but you need to figure it out. Um, I think this is what is useful for, you know, in terms of uh, a kind of institutional, um, conventional kind of formal class-based uh, kind of curriculum is that you get that feedback, but it's always possible to get, even if you are, um, if you are directing your own education um, yourself, um, make and make and make and ask yourself questions and then, you know, get in touch with somebody. Um, a lot of, uh, professionals, I think, you know, we have these images of them as being kind of, um, inaccessible, um, or, uh, you know, somehow out of our league. Um, but I think that, you know, even a lot of students and I tell my students, this is, um, even if you're not planning on working someplace, even if you're not ready to to practice, even if you're um, you, you're not sure about what what you want to do, is like send the designer an email and ask them if they would look at your work, spend a half hour with you, where you can ask them questions. Um, I think a lot of a lot of working designers, even the you know the so called you know rock stars, um, uh, the royalty uh, of of the design uh, industry. Uh, yeah, sure, they're busy, uh, but I think that they are likely to be um, somewhat generous people, and um, you know, with enough planning, um, would be perfectly happy to sit and talk with somebody, even for a half hour, which can be very, very valuable um, for a student or someone who is self-teaching, or even in between semesters. You know, do some exploration. You know, go after. Um, you know, revisit something that you didn't do so well or that you that you don't feel you got enough of, you know, during during the school year um, and test that thing out um, in as many ways that you can. I mean, the the the, the creative impulse is something that has to be um, uh, has to be driven from within. It can't come from outside. Um, uh, and and you know, go out and find the find the information that you need. You, you're sure, you know, YouTube is an excellent source of some information. You know, there's a lot of designers and that have you know have little you know quick lessons like how to make a logo in like five minutes. 
um, you know, you can get some insights there, you know, it's kind of a baseline uh, level. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put too much stock in there, but the more things that you, that you, you know, expose yourself, you have to find the things to expose yourself to. You have to find what the reading is. You have to understand the tools that you're working with. And, and so, um, and you have to know what it is that you're making and you can't do that without, without making it. So um, I think, that, you know, education is very much a, a dialogue. Yes. Uh, even a formal education, you are, and you should expect um, that your instructors and their expertise are valuable, and that's what you're paying for to a certain degree, and you're also paying for that that environment. Um, but even in that situation, as a student, you are also contributing something. You have to ask the questions. You have to be a pain in the ass. You have to make and make and make, um, and you have to find out. Um, the things that you need to find out. And you don't always know what you're not finding out until you ask the question. I think a lot of students are, are afraid of asking questions. Um, you know, because there is that kind of power imbalance. You know, there's, there, there's an authority figure, uh, especially if they're young, you know, sort of typically college age. It's like they're still thinking kind of in terms of, you know, the high school or, you know, the, the teacher is a kind of a parent figure. You have to throw that out the window. It's, you know, um, Absolutely. do what you got to do. Absolutely. Well, it's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. And thank you again. That was that was lovely. It was nice talking. We'll see you soon.